say hello to people as they start coming in. We're just going to allow um, a minute or two for people to get into the webinar and then we will begin. Good to see everybody arriving this morning. I'm just going to allow a, a minute or so for people to arrive and then we'll start. We'll start very shortly. We're just giving everybody a chance to get into the webinar. Sometimes takes a moment. I can hear the sound of people virtually shifting in their digital seats. You're very welcome this morning. Okay, I think we're going to begin. So I'd like to um, welcome everybody this morning. Um, my name is Andrew Sims. I coordinate the Rapid Transition Alliance. We are your hosts for the day today, and we're hosting the wonderful Hot or Cool Institute, um, who is a member, who are a member of the Rapid Transition um, Alliance. Um, I'll say all the usual things that we say on these webinars, um, which should be second nature to most people. Um, we like to conduct uh, respectful exchanges and um, please make sure that all your um, comments and questions, which we hope there will be many of, inspired by the launch of today's report, are, um, are respectful and polite and constructive. And you have the two usual options of putting questions into the chat function or using the Q&A function. If you use the Q&A function, it allows any of our panelists to answer as we carry on, but we will raise your questions once once we've heard from all our speakers. The reason we're here today is for the launch of the Unfit, Unfair, Unfashionable Resizing Fashion for a Fair Consumption Space Report, which has been produced by the Hodder Call Institute and published jointly with the Rapid Transition Alliance. We understand that sitting here this week, after two weeks worth of intense climate debate and negotiation, there's probably a little bit of COP27 fatigue amongst people. But the reason that we've published today is because there's been barely a breath between the intense negotiations and the frustration of the negotiations on climate change in Sharm El Sheikh and the fact that we bounce straight from that to um, possibly the year's greatest orgy of overconsumption known as Black Friday with very few people making the connection between the two and one of the major items of consumption is of course fashion and trends in the consumption of fashion and in particular fast fashion um, we understand cannot be maintained if we are to achieve a fair and just transition there's mounting scientific evidence now which clearly clearly revealed the, um, the great extent of negative, both environmental and social impacts of fashion consumption, um, as well as the fact that the responsibility for some of these worst impacts lie very differently between high and low income countries and within different groups within society, high and low income groups. So this report, which we're going to hear about in detail in a moment, uh, aims to fill that knowledge gap, which uh, is in most climate scenarios on the issue of fashion, um, that tends to underplay the potential contribution of lifestyle change but um, don't worry we are talking both about system change and lifestyle change but we're taking a slightly cautious approach about the overpromise of some technological fixes meanwhile um, it's understandable that people might be confused on this issue because there are very mixed messages in the world around us the very same media that is carrying stories of worsening climate change is also full of adverts promoting that same overconsumption which is driving the problem um, we call it advertising, which is in fact an additional and separate campaign. And perhaps fashion will stray into the scope of some of the rising chorus of voices uh, that are suggesting that we need to stop promoting our own self-destruction by using sort of tobacco style bans on high carbon goods. Um, we're going to see 
big changes. That's what we know. If we're going to solve this problem, you're going to hear about ideas of the sufficiency wardrobe today. And you're going to hear about how it, this issue is not primarily a problem of the poor shopping in Primark, but some of the richest consumers and the responsibilities that they've got um, sitting on their shoulders. Now, we're also in the early days of uh, one of the world's great media events, um, the World Cup. And to put into context the scale of changes that's going to be needed among some of the richest consumers, I looked up yesterday one of our headline findings that you're going to hear about in much more detail about how the richest fifth of consumers in the richest part of the world um, are going to have a quota of perhaps no more than five new garments per year. And to put that into perspective, if you were a keen football fan following one of the world's biggest football clubs, a club like Manchester City, that means given that every year they produce new kit and encourage their fans to buy it and they produce five different types of new kit a home kit and a waste strip a third kit an e-kit and a goalkeeper kit you could use up your entire quota just by being a dedicated follower of manchester city football club so we're going to need to see some system and behavior change and we've got a fantastic lineup of people to speak to you today to talk about this issue and come at it from very different perspectives as well so we hope to get a very rounded picture we're going to be hearing um, about the report itself in detail from Louis Akenji who's the director of the hot or cool institute and he's going to speak for 15 or so minutes and then we're going to hear some reflections from some a, a fantastic lineup of panelists we're going to hear from professor Dillis Williams who's director at the center for sustainable fashion and professor of fashion design for sustainable sustainability. We're going to be hearing from Lars Mortensen, who's an expert in consumption products and plastics at the European Environment Agency. And we're going to be hearing from Kiersi Ninimaki, who's Associate Professor in Design at the Alto University School of Arts, Design and Architecture, and also from Ruth McGilp, for, who's the Communications Manager at Fashion Revolution. But to begin with, I'm going to hand over the floor to my great friend and colleague, a groundbreaking thinker for this groundbreaking report, Louis Akenji. Louis, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. Uh, to those of you online, uh, so happy that you could decide to spend this time with us. Uh, we're not going to wash our dirty laundry in public, but we're going to ask lots of questions that would send us to the dry cleaner after this. Um, my, my wonderful colleague, Dr. Koshieme, was supposed to present this report, but he, he had a very sweet gift recently. He had a baby, so he's somewhere loving her uh, as, as I present. So please accept me as a poor substitute for uh, Luca. Um, unfit, unfair, and unfashionable. Um, why fashion, you would say? Uh, fashion really pulls together, especially on sustainable fashion, pulls together so many elements of the poly crisis that we have right now. Uh, you can think of fashion production as uh, having impact on land use patterns. You can think of it as uh, polluting waters. You can think of it in terms of social aspects such as uh, labor and labor conditions and rights. But fashion also tends to be a bit more personal around identity issues, around cultures, so all of these are woven into a tapestry that makes it very difficult to pull apart. So if we can manage to handle the issue of unsustainable fashion production and consumption, there are lessons there that we can draw to other areas. So let's look at why we say this is unfit, unfair, and unfashionable as current practices stand. Some of you would recall we had the 1.5 degree lifestyles report come out last year, analyzing potential contributions of um, lifestyle changes to the 1.5 degree limit that we have uh, in the Paris Agreement. And in that, we analyze the IPCC given budget that is remaining on an equitable basis to stay under 1.5 and distributed it uh, across uh, several countries. What it showed us from a consumption-based perspective is that lifestyle carbon footprints are currently at 4.6 tons per person per year, and they ultimately need to go down to 0.7 tons. There's an intermediary which we're using here for the fashion report, which is 2.5 tons per person per year of CO2 equivalents. Uh, um, this is what we're applying to the fashion sector. And in this report, we've chosen 2030. Now, if you look at fashion uh, in a bit more detail, you would notice exactly why we're highlighting it. There are varying estimates of how much its impact is on climate change. 
some of them at uh, just under 4%, uh, percent, uh, some up to 10% if you take the estimates of UNEP. No matter which of the numbers you take, this is very significant in terms of impact from a sector that is not so much talked about uh, from a climate perspective. And it is clear from analysis by the global fashion agenda that without any decarbonization action, the sector will be emitting close to 3 billion tons of CO2 by 2030. But we're also not noticing three trends from a consumption perspective that, have, uh, that are quite jarring. On the one hand, there is falling prices. Um, households in the, in, in the G2, among G20 economies, which we analyze, used to spend about 6% of their income on fashion uh, in 1995. And that number has dropped to about 4% of their income. So fashion is getting a lot cheaper but the sales are also much faster uh, increasing. If you think of uh, fashion cycles and so on, the, the, the consumption per person is rising very dramatically. And to compound this, the use time per article has shortened. So cheaper products, quicker sales, shorter time use, just make for a fashion sector that is on course to double its emissions by 2030. What is unfair about this, fashion, uh, uh, more than most other uh, consumer items, really embodies the aspect of inequality that we talk about, um, or that we fail to talk about, I would say. These are analysis of G20 countries that we've done in the report. And what uh, you're looking at is carbon footprints from fashion consumption, on a, uh, which are equitably distributed across this country. So, the guy in Japan has the same as the girl in, in Indonesia. You don't get more of a carbon budget just because you're grandfathered in one country. And um, the target, if you were to stay with 1.5, is that on a yearly basis, we, it should be at about 130 kilograms per person. Now, if you look at this very clearly, the dotted line shows that uh, countries like Australia and Japan are way, way above where they should be. And there are countries like India and Brazil that are barely able to meet their own needs. And uh, something that is very clear in here is that a lot of the impact that comes from fashion is really from the production side, from the upstream that includes around cultivation, garment tailoring and, um, and finishing. But you would ask, why do we use consumption-based analysis? That is because this analysis allows us to get emissions that uh, are emitted within the country and also emissions from all the made in China and made in Bangladesh fashion that you consume, but that doesn't necessarily get accounted for when you use territorial uh, based emissions. At the current rate, fashion sector needs to reduce to about 1.1 billion tons by 2030. If you compare it to where they were in uh, 2018, that should be about 50 to 60% reduction. What our report shows and what we're analyzing is that for at least 14 of the G20 economies, they've overshot where they should be if they were to be compliant with the 1.5 limit. And so there's a need for about 60% reduction in fashion footprints from the high income G20 countries. These are Australia, Canada, Germany, Italy, France, Japan, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, the UK and the US. And uh, just a little less at about 40% need for reduction among the G20 upper income countries like Argentina, Brazil, China, Mexico, Russia, South Africa, and Turkey. But the story of inequality gets even deeper within countries. The uh, figures I'm showing you are analyzing consumption for different quintiles. So you would see that the richest 20% in all the countries we've analyzed in G20 are over consuming while the bottom 20% income earners uh, in almost all these countries are barely trying to keep up. So the narrative that uh, it's the poor people buying cheap stuff and thrashing is really not true if you analyze fashion from a quantitative perspective. So what it shows very clearly is that the lowest 20% income earners in the uh, G20 cause just um, anywhere up to 11% while the richest 20% cost somewhere up to 42% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the richest 20% cost about 20 times the emissions that uh, the, the, the poorest sort of uh, release greenhouse gas emissions. But this, of course, this 
varies depending on the inequality and income level in the countries. And um, if you're looking at it from the need for reduction, the richest 20% therefore need to reduce their fashion consumption. If you take the UK, for example, it needs to go down by about 83% by 2030 and 75% in Italy and in Germany, about uh, in France, about 50% within the next eight years. So our target is 2030. We're going to go a little bit more, uh, pick up on snippets that show how really unfashionable this is. Some of the knee-jerk reaction that we have is that by totally just donating our clothes and shipping them out uh, somewhere else, it, it solves the problem. The issue of distancing, we don't see what really happens to it. But there is, uh, from our analysis, showing that about 10% of uh, emissions occur at the disposal phase of garments uh, really linked to secondhand donations and exports to other countries, Africa, Asia, and uh, Latin America from Europe and, and the US, for example. And about 30% of used clothes I, uh, export, uh, that are exported are either directly incinerated or a landfill. So what this shows you really very clearly is that donation uh, or uh, exporting of secondhand clothing is really should not really be a priority. It should be very low down on the list of options that need to be taken if we are to address the issue. Now, how do we re resize or how do we understand the approaches towards resizing this sector and getting a fair consumption space for fashion? What you're seeing, uh, the figure you're looking at, let's start with the one to the left. For the report, we analyzed five different options from a consumption uh, perspective, showing what reductions could come from there. These are increasing use times of garments, uh, reducing uh, washing and drying by about 60%, uh, responsible uh, disposal, sort of um, recycling, and uh, buying of secondhand clothes. Uh, by the way, if I talk of increasing use time of garments, this we're looking at somewhat of nine months here. This just tells just how wasteful we are. There are lots of wardrobes sitting with clothing that is bought, used for just five, six months, or used just once, and then disposed or you know shipped off to another country. But what becomes very clear from our analysis, from footprint analysis, is that just buying one, uh, just buying uh, fewer items alone. Is, uh, has significantly more impact in reducing emissions from fashion consumption compared to all the other options combined. So the option of buying off and, and then shipping off or donating really doesn't come close to not buying at all. But you can look at this more clearly in how it can be visualized uh, to your right. In, in the UK, for example, about 400 kilograms can be uh, saved from increasing use time of garments, reducing washing and drying, responsible disposal, and buying secondhand clothing. But if an average UK citizen bought fewer clothing items, they would be close to saving a thousand kilograms a year. And uh, of course, because of the uh, differences in income and the economy, India has a far lower figure, but a sort of corresponding pattern in, in that regard. In a previous report, we talked about a fair consumption space. This fair consumption space exists somewhere between the need to reduce overconsumption for those that the richest 20% that are overconsuming to bring them within the 1.5 target, but also to remember that there are people that are living below the poverty line or below lines that allow them to uh, consume in a way that meets their needs to operate with dignity in society. So that creates a social floor that we should make sure whatever act interventions we're taking, people should not fall below. Between that ceiling, that environmental ceiling and that social floor is where you find a fair consumption space. We've analyzed a fair consumption space for the fashion sector and from a consumption-based perspective, the environmental ceiling is set around the, the per capita target in keeping with 1.5. So that's about one, uh, 130 kilograms of uh, CO2 emissions equivalents per person per year. And the sufficiency level for this is uh, calculated at about 58 or roughly 60 uh, kilograms per person per year. If you look at this very carefully, uh, 
the diamond, the black diamonds are the average uh, for the country. And the uh, very far up ones to your right are showing where the richest 20% or the top quintile of the population is. And you can see they're so far away from this fair consumption space and only to be pulled somewhere in there. A country like India also tells a very interesting story. India tends to also be unequal, but it is such that the top 5% could be so rich that anywhere shortly below that for those, the rest of those in the top 20%, they're not doing well enough to offset really the impact of that top. Uh, they're not doing well enough to um, pull the whole country or the rest of the country outside of this zone where, which is below the sufficiency level. So there's a lot of disparity in consumption here. If uh, you wanna follow the, the popular saying, just go say, follow the money and it will tell you exactly where impacts are and where actions need to be taken. So where do we go from here? The, um, any solutions that want to have any form of legitimacy need to uh, address the rich. And by the rich, I don't mean those people that you see flying, just those people you see fly, flying private jets. It's also them, yes, but it's the top 20%. And by some estimates, if you live in Germany, for example, earning about 3,900 euros already keeps you somewhere around that top 20%. So this is not as far off as you might think. And we need to start talking a little bit more seriously and very soon about choice editing. The choice architecture needs to be revamped in a way that it doesn't tolerate certain things. Fast fashion, for example, is just very reckless if we're talking about a climate emergency. And the export of secondhand clothing, for example, uh, needs to be reduced to a, a very low priority. But we also need to edit in a few other things such as longer time use, repairability and share schemes, and of course, uh, Andrew mentioned at the beginning, a sufficiency wardrobe. One of the things we've done in this report, which I urge you to go look at, is what really is a sufficiency wardrobe that meets your needs, stays within the climate uh, uh, target, and allows you to have a dignified social presence. We've done uh, quantitative estimations for this, including an example of a sufficiency wardrobe and the number of garments that are in there. But it's not just from the consumption side. It is becoming very clear that technology and efficiency improvements are not enough if we want to address this issue. So the fashion industry needs to go beyond that. And in fact, policymakers need to think of much tougher regulation and standards for this sector. Overproduction is clearly an issue right now, but there's also quite uh, questionable practices around destruction of unsold garments or returned items and uh, supply chain practices that are quite adversarial when you think of social conditions in countries like um, labor conditions in countries like Bangladesh, Nepal, and other places that are producing primarily for consumption by uh, Western societies. Um, it is also the power asymmetries, the power of the top brands in this sector and how much they're really influencing policy makers and policy making processes. This, lack of transparency, we need to break into the black box of the fashion sector in order to come clean and start addressing it. Uh, I talked a little bit about the fashion wardrobe. Here's just a teaser for you. You would read a little bit more about it, including a number of items that are applicable to you in the report. So in the interest of time, I would like to acknowledge that um, a lot of work went into this. There's uh, Luca who is taking care of his lovely baby uh, right now. and um, my colleagues at the uh, uh, Horoku Institute, various other colleagues from the Sustainable Fashion Consumption Network and uh, from Rapid, Tra uh, Rapid Transition Alliance of which we are members. But I'd also like to thank the KR Foundation for having funded this wonderful work and for continuing to support the work in this direction. If you wanna get more on this report, it is now available online and uh, please download it, get back to us and let's have a conversation about coming clean. Thank you. Wonderful, Lewis. That's great. Um, I'm going to go to Dillis in a moment. I just want to ask you a quick question. Um, I, I'm, I'm intrigued that were you, you've been working in this area for quite some time, but were you surprised at the scale of inequality that you came over? 
you came across. Um, and the second question, uh, which I think is interesting for people because it's slightly counterintuitive. I think many people might see the network of secondhand clothes shops and charity shops as being part of a wider green economy. But you kind of raised a question there over them. And I suppose I wanted to say, um, I mean, in some senses, they maybe they create access for people on lower incomes. But uh, do you see that they will still have a role in a kind of a future and more sustainable um, um, system? So there's a question there about the degree of um, inequality and were you shocked and and painting that picture of the of the choice architecture and what it looks like o on the ground will there still be a role for people's sort of loved secondhand clothes shops and that's to you lewis i'm i'm sorry uh, yes there is a role so uh, i think part of what this report the presentation might come about uh, come across as suggesting that secondhand shops are not a good idea. In fact, they are, but it cannot be counted upon as the uh, the the main avenue to address the, the 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 magnitude and urgency of the problem that we now have. Scientists would talk of something called rebound effect. This is just jargon for saying you're consuming too much, right? And if you keep buying so much of secondhand goods without an understanding of what a sufficiency wardrobe is supposed to contain, ultimately your wardrobe gets overfilled. So there is room for sh secondhand shopping. There is room for donations for those of us that uh, think of doing good work and supporting others. But this does not supersede the need to actually reduce uh, uh, consumption and even more important to reduce production. Wonderful, Liz. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're now going to hear from some of our panelists to sort of react and reflect on the report, but also just to give us an insight from their perspectives and the angle that they are working at the industry from. We've um, suggested a few uh, issues that we might want to look at, not exhaustively, but um, one of the biggest challenges, of course, is that the, the changes implied by this report are huge, and we're inviting people to imagine how rapid transition may happen within within the industry, and specifically amongst those who are the biggest overconsumers. And this big picture of inequality, both in terms of consumption and the unequal distribution of benefits along the production and supply chain, we're wondering how this can be reversed, and whether we're just relying on alone upon putting the information out there and hoping that things happen. And then the big one, of course, ultimately, how are we going to decouple fashion from fossil fuels? Um, but to kick us off, and um, I have to say that we're delighted to have Dillis uh, Williams with us. She's going to have to leave slightly earlier than some of the other panelists, so she's going to speak first. Um, and um, Professor Dillis Williams, again, is Director at the Centre for Sustainable Fashion and Professor of, of, of Fashion Design for Sustainability. So, so Dillis, over to you. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you very much, Lewis. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me to respond to the report. Uh, just to give you a little bit of, of context, uh, as, as, as Andrew said, uh, Centre for Central Fashion explores what fashion design looks like when you have a well-being framework. When you look at the contribution that fashion makes on a personal, societal and biosphere level in societal, cultural, environmental and economic terms. And that's the sort of basis of, of how we work. We really uh, welcome this report. Uh, we work with students, with small and large businesses, with governments. Um, and I think what this particularly says is there's lots of great things that we need to do. But actually, where do we need to, to create focus? I set up the centre 15 years ago, very proud of a lot of things we've done. But actually, if I'm totally honest, the issues are bigger now than they were 15 years ago. They're more urgent. And we really have to decide out of all the important things, what is really important to look at. So the report for me raises a few different things I'd like to kind of foreground. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have a lot more in the, in the Q&A. First of all, it's a simple but profound message. Those with the most have to make the most change. The biggest area of impact is those who already have the most. So actually, that should be a no-brainer. Uh, fashion is something that should be about delight. It should be about enjoyment. How do we become more selective about the things that we choose to represent ourselves with? So um, the report offers these different scenarios, three different scenarios. And actually, this most radical sufficiency wardrobe is one where we're thinking about uh, the idea of, of this top 20% that you just mentioned. But I think if we invert this idea of 
buying less and thinking about what we have to limit it seems as if that's somebody taking something away from us and think more about how can we be more selective how can we think more about the enjoyment and the delight that's actually the premise of luxury the premise of luxury is about cherishing things about things that are rare and and beautiful so we've got a, a program called fashion values that invites customers students young designers and big industry uh, designers to think about actually how you can have this fourfold value. And we are starting to see a very different way in which designers are thinking, certainly through the education system. What, what has changed a lot over the last 15 years is that designers want something that they can feel really proud about. We're also seeing business quickly thr thistle is an example. Clio is an Maison Clio is an example. I could now list a, a very long list of examples of businesses who are limiting their production and creating something that is being really cherished. So it's not as if we're starting from, from scratch here. There's lots of things going on. They just don't necessarily get the, the limelight and get the focus. But at the same time, we've already seen that this is happening whilst the overstimulation is continuing. And we can't, we can't have both of those things happening. So for me, the second uh, thing to, to highlight is the limitations of the technocentric approach. If we are going to invert the system and have an earth and equity based system that the economy sits around, then we really have to think about shifting the lens from um, a volume based approach. Um, and we do have to, to cut volumes. No, no doubt. Um, and that means that we have to have legislation. I know Lars is going to talk about that in a, in a little while. The Environmental Audit Committee produced a report four years ago called Fixing Fashion, talking about extended producer responsibility. It's starting to happen in the EU. It needs to happen in the UK and it needs to be robust. It needs to be talking not just about principles of eco design. It actually needs to, to um, talk about the limiting of, of production as well as looking about the responsibility of what has already been produced. The legislation about greenwashing as well is absolutely vital. Uh, it's very confusing for customers, even with the greatest intentions. But we have got good examples. Patagonia has announced that the earth is its greatest shareholder. From an investment perspective, we're starting to see that investors only want to invest in businesses who really do have the credentials for being more than short term. We're also seeing from a procurement perspective that from an accounting model, some of the, the big in, luxury uh, businesses have already been doing this for a while. Uh, climate accounting and nature accounting will have to become part of the procurement process. So this is absolutely vital. I think the next thing, and I know I'm very aware of how much time I've got, and I'm just trying to fit in as many little points as I can to hopefully uh, invite some, some questions. Uh, fashion is about change. It should be an area that we can actually rapidly transition, because if it suddenly becomes socially uh, unacceptable to be fossil fuel guzzlers, we've seen it on social media, some of the big celebrities being called out for their use of private jets, you can actually shift what is socially acceptable really quite quickly. So we do need the outliers. We need the uh, the people who are very much in the limelight to, to talk about shifting things. But we also need to, to shine a light on some of those small businesses who have already shifted because they are more able to change more quickly than some of the big guys. We work with a lot of small businesses. We've got a, um, a project called Fostering Sustainable Practices. And we've now got lots of case studies of uh, small businesses that are looking at an expanded role of the designer. So Phoebe English is working with farmers. She's looking at soil regeneration. It's part of the curriculum now in, in some of our courses. This for me is very exciting as a designer who did not uh, have anything to do with looking at environmental and social um, aspects of, of thinking about design. This really is changing things. It just needs to be spread more, more widely. Vinonomi, they're at Fashion Week, but they're not actually on schedule. So why are they not right in the center of, of what we're saying that fashion um, is about if it's being relevant? And then finally, because I'm sure I'm nearly up to my five minutes, um, I think that the report blows out of the water the apparent justification of cheap fashion as being a kind of balm for the poor. Uh, it's this idea that the reason behind fast fashion is to be able to democratize fashion. We've known for a long time that's the, uh, the myth of that is fantastic to see that evidenced here. Um, it also shows that actually 
if fashion does start to pay properly, if you do to um, phase out fossil fuels, if you do think about um, something that actually contributes to society, the people who are buying it can still afford it. They can afford to buy fashion, keep the livelihoods that, that um, are currently, you know, we've seen in Bangladesh. Bangladesh has actually uh, come out of being um, the sort of bottom strata from a, from a livelihood perspective because of the fashion industry. We don't want to, to stop people making fashion in areas where actually it's important to livelihoods. We just need to pay them properly and stop the exploitation. Those buying fast fashion actually could buy less and better we still can have that industry. So there's plenty to choose from, from a non-fossil fuel perspective. Look at the new Walmart campaign, for example. Um, I think the choice editing conversation is a really important one. I've just come last weekend from Clerkenwell Vintage Fair, where the delight in one-off pieces that have been cherished for many years and, and what it means to people when they're looking at them and, and realizing that they can be the only ones that have got that in their wardrobe. Um, this, is, this is what fashion can be about. Um, and the cultures around really cherishing what fashion is, is something that customers want, designers want. Uh, how can we shift the economic model uh, through legislation and through infrastructure? So I could talk for, for longer, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm sure I'm up to my time. So thank Phyllis, you. That's, fan that, that's fantastic. It's comprehensive. We've got a rapid fire sweep of the landscape. Um, just a quick follow up question to you, I suppose. Um, for people who've been working in the area of sustainability for a long time, I suppose we're quite familiar that there's, there's always a few vanguard operations and businesses, and there's always a kind of a niche for people who want to be more aware consumers often very hard getting it out of the niche and into the mainstream but like you've said fashion as an industry is almost in the embodiment of change and I wonder um, if we are successful about making the sufficiency wardrobe the new new thing fashion is also a restless place how can we anchor it so that it stays there and people just don't think one year on, oh, we've done sufficiency, let's go back to doing it how we used to do it. How, how can we get it to take root? That's a great question. I, th I think, I mean, I'm a designer and I work with uh, designers in very large businesses as well as very small businesses. And ultimately you want to create something that is gonna be worn. You don't wanna create something that's gonna to go to landfill. So actually the sort of ethos of, of designing is about creating something that people are gonna feel great wearing. So I don't think it is something that will uh, kind of be a passing fad. I think that designers have been kind of uh, employed to be pushers and actually designers are, are kind of fighting back. And we're seeing that in very big businesses as well as small businesses. We're all human. We all want to create something that is going to be valued. So giving uh, the agency to those design teams um, and also working across businesses. I mean, we we, we find that we sometimes are, are kind of bridging what's happening in the creative departments with what's happening in the buying departments and merchandise departments. I think the sort of joined upness um, is also going to change things. But we, as as, um, as as Lewis said, we also need the legislation to stop to take away the license to do harm. We need all of those things collectively. Wonderful, Dillis. Thank you so much. And if anybody's got specific questions for Dillis while she's still here, please put them in the Q and A, and I'll invite. Um, Dillis to dive into the Q&A and have a look and answer any that she would like to. Now, I'd like to invite Lars Mortensen from the European Environment Agency to give us some reflections next. Lars lives in that space where um, he's acutely aware of the ecological realities of the world, but he also probably has in his ears the words from politicians at the European, from the European Commission and, and, and its member states telling him that there are other political realities that have to be dealt with that uh, run up against the ecological realities. So, Lars, how do you see the process of change happening? Thanks so much, Andrew. It's really a pleasure to be here. First of all, I really want to congratulate uh, my former colleague, Luca, Lewis, and the team for what I think is a really, really excellent report. I think it's groundbreaking. I think you've taken the discussion a step further than anybody has done before in the inequality space. I think that's really, really important. So I'm very happy to see that. I have three points to make, basically. One point is that for a rapid transition, I think we have a really good vehicle in the EU strategy on sustainable and circular textiles. Secondly, I want to say that we need to bring, we need policies at the global level. And thirdly, I want to say that, you know, a shift to bio-based versus, and away from synthetic to bio-based is probably not the solution. But let me start with my first point on the, on a rapid transition. 
You started, Andrew, talking about the COP. I don't think the solution lies in the COP. I worked to prepare COP1. Now we're in COP27. I think that says everything. But we do have, I think, in the EU, we have a new strategy on textiles, the first ever. And in this strategy, it actually says that fast fashion is out of fashion. That's a very brave thing to say for politicians. The strategy also has some elements that I think if we implement it in the right way can make a big difference. We have a revision of uh, the EU eco-design criteria. So the eco-design will actually be applied to textiles now. So if we do that right, that we have demands on textiles that they have to live up to certain quality, repairability criteria, it will make a big difference. And also the digital product part part with, where brands have to say what is in the textiles will make a, a big difference. Secondly, there is in the strategy uh, a proposal which will, I'm sure, be implemented to have extended producer responsibility. So you make the brands responsible for, for having less waste and for dealing with it. And then the strategy is also that the commission wants to limit and uh, eventually stop the export of textile waste. This is a big thing. Huh? Uh, we are about to publish a report on the EU exports of textile waste, where we see the export goes to Asia and to Africa. And what happens to, uh, to it there is, is, is not a very encouraging story, as Louis also said. Huh? So we, we have to stop that. And thirdly, and, and I think most importantly in the strategy is the wording about the avoiding of destruction of unsold and returned textiles. Huh? This is something that has not been dealt with before. We don't know how much textiles are returned. We don't know how much is unsold. Imagine if it's one third of all textiles which are never sold or which are returned and then destructed. We're gonna look into that next year. And if that is so much, we can actually achieve a lot by getting by avoiding all this inefficiencies and, and waste in the sector. So I think in that we can we can really make a, 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 a big deal. So I, I hope for the support of and the push from everybody to implement the strategy. My second point is, uh, is on uh, equality because you are showing the huge inequality here between countries and, and within countries. And I think to get rid of that inequality, we need to bring this to the global level. We need global policies on textiles. I think we should all push to have uh, possibly uh, you know, some resolutions at the global level, possibly even a, a global strategy on, on, on textiles like the one which is being negotiated starting next week on plastic. So this is this is really what uh, what we need, and uh, and my third and final point is on the is on you know how you how you how you limit how you decouple from fossil fuels. That's really tricky eh? because the the obvious solution was would would be to say okay let's get rid of the synthetic textiles. The problem is if we get rid of synthetic textiles in fashion, then we move towards bio based, but they have other impacts. They have impacts on water use, they have impacts on land use. So we, we have to be careful we don't shift the problem. And I think that implies actually that goes back to, to the quality and to the design that we need, you know, better fashion of higher quality with uh, the same fibers, you know, so it's not a type of shifting fibers, it's about it's about the amounts, I would say. Yeah? So, so I do think we, we have, a, we have a lot of options, I would say that my final comment is that many think, oh, this is up to the consumers and us citizens to change. I think, of course, we should do what we can, but this is a system. This is a system and a sector which has not been regulated until now, basically. This is a system that has to change. Responsibility lies within all the companies. They have to act very responsibly, and it relies with our, with our politicians who have to take the lead and regulate so that we make sure that we reduce the carbon and other emissions from, from, from fashion. And I'm quite optimistic. I think if you compare to the COP process, you know, we started a year ago, we're actually quite far. You know, we're not 27, 27 years into it. I think in a year or two, we should have made a lot of progress. I really hope so. Lars, thank you so much. And all I can say is you must have been very, very young when you went to COP1. I can't quite believe that you've been going to them for the last 27 years. But I, I have a question I, for I you. I haven't got to all of them. I've went to the first one only and then I don't know. That was I... enough. <laughs> um, so you talk very eloquently about the need for global level action. 
And from the perspective of a body like the European Environment Agency, you're acutely aware of how, when we look at the global stage, whenever there are deals to do with things like trade and investment, these are agreements which often have real teeth attached to them. When we look at many of our international environmental and labor agreements, these are more often about promises and pledges and voluntary agreements. Can you imagine a situation in which, if we're looking at this problem, we, were, we would get a global, some sort of global deal that would actually have some teeth? Is there, a, are we going to be able to move to that phase? Thanks for asking, Andrew. I think, yes, I think we can. I think on, uh, on plastics, which is a comparable problem in a way you can say there is current negotiations on a global agreement on plastics, which is to be ended in, in two years. It looks like there will be something, a, a, an agreement, hopefully with really ambitious targets and commitments. And I think for textiles, we can do the same thing that this report and others really show this is a global problem. And, you know, with, as Europeans, you know, we, we hate seeing our used clothes ending up in landfills in other regions of the world. But the fact that this ends up everywhere means it's a problem for everybody. It means that all countries have an interest to deal with this. So I, I think, yes, I think realistically we can, we can move towards some kind of global agreement on this, I would say. Fantastic. And let's hope it has some strong compliance mechanisms that make sure that if people sign up to it, they actually do what they say. Right. Now, we're going to uh, move on to Kiersi Ninimaki. And um, apologies if I haven't pronounced your name exactly correctly, who's Associate Professor in Design at Aalto University School of Arts, Design and Architecture. Kiersi, over to you. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here in this webinar today. Uh, and perhaps I will also provide a little bit like background where I'm coming from. So Aalto University is in Finland uh, and I'm running their research group which is called Fashion Textile Futures. Uh, so I'm from design research side uh, and actually we are, we are running quite many different kind of research projects uh, and collaborate quite actively with the industry. So and sustainability has really been in the core of our research quite many years. I myself I'm really interested about this how to how to expose or how to find the connections, how we design, how we produce, how we consume, as well as what is the business logic behind of the system. So I think that this kind of like a system understanding actually is the, the behind of or core of our, our research currently. Uh, and thanks for, for Lars and Dilis to start the, the, the presentations or the conversation. I think that we really need this kind of new, new kind of system understanding. I totally uh, agree with Lars that we need a policy policy regulations, we need tools how to make this transition happening faster. And of course, I think that while well, we need upper level regulations, how this actually will happen. Seems to be that currently industry is quite well aware what, what happens and also the discussion and they see that actually the transition is coming, it will be a big one. And they are a little bit worried about their own, own business practices or business logic that how actually they can jump into this new kind of understanding of sustainability. So there's a lot of this kind of interest towards new knowledge, which is of course very positive, but uh, currently also a lot of worries that how actually, how this will actually change the whole business. But I think that we have to be realistic. And of course, this report is one of those kind of critical statements that actually currently might be that what we are doing in the context of sustainability might be too small, that we really have to begin to think radically and might be that there are some somebody who wins and somebody who actually loses uh, the game. So that's just the reality that we currently exist. But I think that, that to push the transition onwards, so really these kind of regulations are needed and, and what happens in EU level, I think that that's really positive uh, development currently because there are a lot of things that links to this uh, EU Green Deal, uh, talking about that the products have to be repairable, they have to be better quali quality, uh, they have to be um, used longer times as well as they have to be also recyclable at the end of their life, lifetime. So currently we are really moving towards the circular economy and that means that actually in the future we have to design totally differently. We have to understand waste totally differently. That is really valuable source uh, for, for textile industry and as Lars already mentioned that we, we have to cut totally exporting the textile waste uh, away from the Europe. <clears throat> 
Uh, in Finland, actually, there's quite interesting situation that we are living. There are many different kind of technological innovation about textile fibers, uh, and many of them actually are focusing on uh, how to to recycle textile waste back into the industry, high high level, new new quality yarns again. So I think that that's actually quite promising. That I I'm, I think that also also these kind of technological innovations are really important one. But then if, uh, when we talk about consumption side, that actually might be living in bit, be, might be a bigger challenge for us because of course fashion consumption is so much about this emotional side. And uh, as uh, Dilis already uh, pointed out, that actually fashion is really important part of our life. If you think about clothing and the identity and the appearances. Uh, that can also give a lot of this kind of emotional um, satisfaction, beauty experiences. It's actually quite important part of our life, but how actually then we can change the mindset from the consumer side and, and trying to uh, educate them to, to value um, materials uh, more than what we do currently and, and try to also educate them how to how to um, maintain clothing correctly so that they are possible to, to use longer. But all actually, I, I'm really welcoming all this kind of like a, a secondhand fashion and swapping and, and repairing or do it yourself. A lot of more, a lot of these kind of like activities that how we can actually take with the power away from the big uh, global fashion companies and be a little bit more active as the consumers in the fashion scene. I think that that's, that's something that we can also educate ourselves and educate others that actually you can be much more active in this fashion consumption side and try to be much more sustainable from your to your own actions. So those are, uh, I think, that the main things that I wanted to highlight. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much. And it's a really fascinating set of insights there. And when you describe the situation in which people have been almost nurtured to become more passive consumers rather than sort of active co-producers of the stuff of life, it made me think that it echoes things and trends which have happened in many other sectors as well. One sees it in the food sector, the sort of de-skilling of a population through the preparation of the selling of ready meals and, and, and all the rest of it. And there's a a tantalizing hint in what you say there, a glimpse of a different future in which we do become those people who can not only maintain, mend and repair our own clothes, but also make them too. And from an economics perspective, there's a fascinating debate about how the idea of the consumer and the producer is sort of falsely separated. And I wonder, do you see much um, evidence as you look around in the conversations that you have? And do you have a kind of a personal belief that there could be what would be quite a big cultural shift to get people out of that passive consumer mindset so that we see ourselves more as producers as well as consumers. Yeah, that's that's an interesting topic, yes. Uh, just before the COVID, actually, I, there was a, a race uh, with the knitting clubs or do-it-yourself or this kind of workshops, how to how to mend your own clothing or how, how to do your own clothing. So I, I saw that that was a good start. And I think that during the COVID time, we have seen a lot of this kind of like, uh, of course, now there are online workshops. Uh, especially knitting has been like a racing hobby in Finland. So there was even a moment uh, when the COVID started that actually all this kind of like a knitting, uh, these sticks as well as the yarns were sold out. So I think that actually that we also have this kind of need that to be more active because I, I think that currently consumers are so passive that we are just buying. So actually this is really passive role for consumers. I think that we can take a much more active role. And I see that, that, that uh, now, now, of course, the secondhand fashion also uh, provides uh, nice ways for, for designers to begin to make their own uh, own fashion based on already existing garments that they are begin to uh, to do um, like a much more personal garments using old uh, old not only old materials but also fashion items so i think that actually is, this also of course uh, links to that how we actually uh, accept fashion what is like a aesthetic of fashion what is acceptable seems to be that actually uh, fashion can be much more personalized in the future that also this kind of like a passive consumer that we are just buying this mass manufacturing same kind of comments. So I think that uh, for, for my eyes, uh, the future looks much, much interesting from that point of view.
Thank you so much. I'm sure somebody um, on the panel is going to be able to tell me the name of the, I believe it's the Japanese art of decorative mending on, on clothes, which I think is a, especially an especially beautiful thing. And thank you also for mentioning the pandemic. I can um, make a mention of the fact that the Rapid Transition uh, Alliance and on the website there, rapidtransition.org, there's actually a number of referenced case studies of the pandemic experiences of people doing exactly what you describe and it being the case across a range of areas, both to do with how we cook, how we entertain ourselves and how we um, mend and make and repair not just our clothes, but other items around the house as well. So do have a look at, at those. There's a series of briefings um, called the Reset Series. Um, right, now for yet another another dimension and another perspective on this, I'm delighted to have uh, Ruth McGilt from um, Fashion Revolution. Over to you, Ruth. Thank you, Andrew, and thanks so much for having me. It's really interesting to see the participants who often are probably much more experts <laughs> in the topic than I am even, but I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about um, living wages as a dimension to this. Currently at Fashion Revolution, we're running a campaign called Good Clothes, Fair Pay, which is calling on the EU to implement legislation that requires brands to do their due diligence on living wages throughout their supply chain. So we're thinking a lot about how, what, what conditions our clothes are made in impact how uh, we buy and wear fashion. Um, and what I found interesting about this report is the fact that in many of the countries where our clothes are made, uh, those, you know, even the average in that country, they're not, you know, reaching that sufficiency wardrobe. So what that tells us is that, you know, the people who make our clothes can't actually afford to buy their clothes that they're making. And, you know, it just kind of exemplifies how unequal this system really is. And we know that living wage benchmarks in most countries are much higher than the minimum wage. And they do also include clothing. So the Europe floor wage and the Asia floor wage uh, benchmarks include, you know, sufficient weather appropriate clothing. But currently, you know, fashion brands aren't paying their suppliers enough. The suppliers can't pay their workers enough to even meet those basic clothing needs. So I think it really um, brings into perspective that as you say, the, the chasm between producer and consumer, we forget that all of us wear clothing, all of us need a sufficient amount of clothing to do our jobs. And currently that's just not being met for garment workers. Another um, aspect to how this living wage campaign relates to consumption is that we believe that a proper living wage, which is a wage earned within a standard work week, so without any overtime, uh, would help slow down the fashion system. Eventually, we want to obviously see brands producing less. Uh, we're yet to see any major brands commit to that kind of degrowth principle, but ultimately the, the speed at which workers are forced to produce and you know, the overtime that they're doing to meet those like unbelievable targets is, is you know, means that the brands have to keep selling more as well. So it, it's all linked. We want, we want to see, you know, everything slow down for people to be paid, you know, for their standard working day and ultimately for that to result in brands producing less. So we really think this legislation could have a huge impact. If you are an EU citizen on this call, please do go and sign our European Citizens Initiative at goodclothesfairpay.eu. And you can find out more about what it actually requires, which includes transparency uh, requirements, which at Fashion Revolution, we believe is really the first step to this systemic change. The reason this report in particular is so groundbreaking is because it's providing data which we really don't have anyone that uh, works in this space knows that the lack of data even not knowing you know what percentage of carbon emissions that the fashion industry contributes is a huge issue and we don't actually have the data on how much clothing is being produced in the world it's all estimates because brands aren't telling us how much they're producing we are encouraging brands to disclose those volumes of production and we've seen increased disclosure over the years but we still don't have the answers um, and as consumers, I truly believe that if we knew how much clothing was being produced, we would have a different view. I think anyone who's worked in retail uh, has been in a, you know, a stock warehouse for a large retailer or even a vintage secondhand warehouse. And you just see the sheer volume of stuff 
in the world it really it changes your perspective you know I've been reading um, a book about degrowth recently and there was a stat in there about how the the, the mass of man-made stuff in the world now outweighs the natural stuff so humans animals plants mountains we have more weight of man-made stuff in the world than we do natural and I think the fashion industry has a lot to answer for there um, so ultimately yeah we believe that living wages will have a huge impact on this space consumers do have a role to play in reducing their consumption but also we need to see ourselves as, as more than just consumers and also as, as citizens of the world we have power in terms of demanding legislation and the petition that we're running is a really good example of that we have power in the questions that we ask to brands even when we do purchase from those brands you know we encourage people to ask who made my clothes you know under what conditions were they made how many uh, skews of this style have you made this year i think with more transparency consumers having more information and really connecting with the stories, the cultures, the lives and the livelihoods behind what we wear, we will change our relationship with consumption. And I know that from a personal level because it's exactly what happened to me. Um, so I think this data can be a really great way in for consumers to really understand the impact of their purchases, but we need legislation to hold brands accountable. And we also need as consumers and as citizens to demand better from the brands that we, you know, part with our cold hard cash with. Ruth, thank you so much. And um, listening to you, you did it in a very light touch way, but I think you've introduced into the debate what I might call the textile elephant in the room. Because if we're to follow through the logic of some of this analysis, ultimately, um, unambiguously, it means consuming less stuff. But of course, as you said, no major producer is going to commit to selling less stuff, um, producing less stuff, because that is the economic model that we sit within. You use the term um, degrowth, which is being debated a lot more widely now. And I wonder if for this issue, given the current economic model we have, does this present us with a red line? And I think I'd quite like to hear um, your reflections on this. And before we go to bring in the questions from um, people who are listening in today, of which there are many and fascinating ones, I think I'm going to put this to warm us up for that to the to the whole panel is this fundamental issue that ultimately we're in a system that demands more sales more consumption and we've identified a problem which requires the opposite is this a red line for the industry and if so what is the next step um, but i'll give that first to you ruth and then i'll go to the rest of the panel Yes, I think that red line has been defined before, and I don't know how many more reports we need to get us there. Ultimately, I think we need, you know, we need a carrot and a stick approach. We need legislation that penalizes environmental harm, that criminalizes environmental harm, and I think overproduction should ca be categorized as such. We also need incentives to businesses to degrow because unfortunately we're in a capitalist system businesses want to continue to make profit we need to make it more desirable and easier for businesses to stay afloat without selling new clothing and i think it's really heartening to see this idea being mainstream now we we see um the british fashion council's new strategy actually mention less production of new clothing and instead profiting from resale upcycling etc um, you know, there's a lot of issues with greenwashing and things like that, but I think ultimately we are moving in the right direction if brands no longer have to produce new to make the same level of profit. Obviously, along with that, we need to see a just transition for workers because the easy argument that a lot of brands make is that we can't produce less because it will impact the livelihoods of garment workers. And in some ways, that's a valid point, but this is coming from the brands who keep these workers trapped in poverty. Um, we need to see investment in the supply chain to uh, transition, you know, traditional new production into recycling, upcycling, mending, um, innovative new design techniques. We need to see retraining taking place. We also need to see brands investing in their suppliers to decarbonize, to uh, switch to renewable energy. We need these brands to take accountability and not just to wash their hands and say, look, we 
are responsible for these people's livelihoods. Therefore, we cannot change our business model. Fashion, as Gillis was saying, is about creativity. It's about innovation. It's about change. It's about joy. And I think we've lost that. We've lost our creativity in creating new new ways of dressing and wearing. So I think, yes, this is a red line for the industry. We need to see both legislation and we need to see that culture change from the bottom up. And I, um, the same as Lars, I'm actually quite optimistic about this at the moment. And the fact that you can say degrowth on a panel now without people flinching, I think is a really good sign. Wonderful, Ruth. So I'm gonna to go to Lewis and then Lars and then Kirsty. And I suppose the question is, do you perceive that there is a viable business model that could work for some of the mainstream um, businesses that would allow decommodification of the scale implied by the research in this report. We'll go to you first, Lewis. Um, thank you so much, uh, Andrew. There's a number of really good points that have come up. I, I just first want to touch on mentioning the EU. I'm, I'm so grateful that Lars has brought this up and that Ruth is also talking about legislation around here. The reason is not only because of the volume of consumption that is happening in Europe. It is also because some of the most powerful actors in this sector are from Europe and they're dominating the global market and dominating labor conditions, environmental conditions and impact in developing in the developing world. If this is not addressed from Europe, it's hard to see how it will be addressed anywhere else. So far, the only thing we've seen is a distancing from that impact, a sort of shifting, like out of sight, out of mind approach to this. So hearing that the EU is actively uh, uh, working in this space or beginning to get less shy about intervening in this space is very encouraging. I think, however, there's a very fundamental recognition that needs to come from this report. It is very, you can put it in a very simple way we are producing much more than we need. Not just more than we need, but much more than we need. And in order to sustain this, we're chucking out things, we're destroying things, we're pushing people to buy more stuff so that we can keep producing much more than we need. This to me does not sound like a viable business approach. It doesn't sound like an approach to solving any environmental problems. It doesn't even sound like an approach to having fun with fashion. So essentially, we're on a destructive sort of approach in dealing with the fashion. Nobody I can argue that the fashion industry should not exist. Of course it should, but to get to us trying to find solutions here, a few things are needed. A lot more transparency from the fashion sector. They've made every effort to block an understanding of production volumes of the data in, in, rela in relation to their operations, just so people cannot get in and expose a lot of what is happening there. Some of this, of course, is tied to business practices and the need to protect business secrets and intellectual property and all of that. Some of it is understandable. Most of it is just an effort to stay black, a black box, whatever you wanna say about it. So the question becomes, and understanding that we need industry and we need businesses providing our fashion needs or our clothing needs or our textile needs. How do we engender a new fashion industry that is not based on this continuous production that is less dependent on running down working conditions in other parts of the world, but that sort of realizes the need for fashion is sort of capped at a certain saturation level and at a certain impact level in provisioning and providing for people's well-being in society. If we take this as the basic tenets of our argument, it becomes radically different how we pursue solutions. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Lewis. Over to you, Lars. Thanks. I very much uh, agree with what uh, Ruth and Lewis are saying. I think basically a large part of the industry is really stuck in the old world of, uh, of a linear business model. I understand that, yes, there is pressure from stakeholders and owners to make money, but the only the way to make money in the, by selling more clothes is not the only way to make money. You know, it's it's a finance. The, they can also make money by selling the same clothes, higher quality to a higher price, or by selling the same things again and again, or by leasing or by reselling. So I think we just need the, 
you know, the, the companies, the brands to come out of come out of the box, be innovative and find new ways of, of, of doing this. Because if they don't do that, we are stuck in the system and we get just overloaded with cheap, cheap clothes, all of us, and then we cannot change. So I really think they need to rethink their business models. Still make money, but without increase in, in the volumes. Thanks, Lars. It's wonderful to hear it put so simply and forcefully. Kirsi. Yes, thanks. I totally agree with Lars. I'm, I'm totally uh, the same opinion. I, I always think that, well, what's the, the, the tightest bottleneck for this sustainable transformation? And I see that it's the current business model. So I don't see very innovative thinking about this business, business model. It seems to be this linear way of producing uh, uh, mass production in, in lower cost countries, just focusing on this uh, lower prices or, uh, or lower quality, actually. I think that that's really a simple way of doing business. There's a lot of uh, small or medium-sized companies who actually are based their business thinking totally differently or business model. And I think that, that actually that's the way to go. And if, if you think that what's the, the production volume currently, that even 20 to 30 percent actually are this kind of overproduced garments, meaning that they, we have to sell them with, with the lower prices because markets are so oversaturated. We as a consumers, we are not able to, to buy buy all the stuff that the, the industry is producing currently. And, and actually a part of that production is also incinerated before anyone is actually using that one. So if you think that that's 20 or 30 percent, that also tells that, well, it's really unhealthy system. And even thinking that, well, can we cut even that part away from the from the current fashion manufacturing, this 20 to 30 percent, that's already a big exercise for the industry that how actually they can do a little bit more accurate design. How, how could they actually understand what's their real consumers needs so that they don't produce over uh, or this kind of extra production who nobody doesn't want to even buy. Or, so it, that's that's a really big system level problem. But I see that while well, the current business models is actually the biggest problem currently, that they think that, well, only this is the way to do the profit. But of course, there's a lot of different ways of doing profit. And I think that while well, in here, even the, the widening the uh, discussion about responsibility that actually and the extend, uh, extended producing responsibility tool would be really welcomed into this discussion that actually producers uh, importance they are also responsible of, of the waste when the product begins to be a waste and what they do with that that material so there would be really many different ways of, of uh, doing the business than what happens currently thank you so much Kirsi and I should also say thank you to the two people in the chat who um told me the name of the decorative mending uh, technique used in Japan, Kintsugi, Kakatsugi, um, two slightly different names for, for, um, for that. I'm going to be looking at uh, pictures of that later on today. Um, thank you uh, for that. And thank you also, everybody, for the wonderfully lively um, conversation that's going on in the chat function. And thank you to everyone who's sharing very useful links. Uh, a reminder that uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available online afterwards. So if you haven't caught everything, don't worry, you'll be able to refer back to it later. But also thank you very much for the specific questions you've been putting in. And now I'm going to move and take some of those because we've got a really good and interesting range and I think um, I'm going to be unfair and go go to um, Ruth first with those which will give the others a, a little more time to consider their responses but we've had um, one which I, I've got a suspicion I, I might guess what your answer to the first one will be about the role of a progressive taxation as a technique for dealing with the problem. A second question we've had is about the potential for influencer culture to start working in the sort of opposite direction to the haul videos we used to see on YouTube in the early days where people glorified and showed off their anti their, their sort of their their consumption. And I'm aware that there has actually been a backlash to that already. And there's a kind of a one of you notable anti haul YouTubers who do the opposite and tell you why you shouldn't buy things. So that's kind of quite an interesting one to explore. And then um, just the third question for this on this occasion is that we're talking a lot about trying to influence people's um, demand and would a shift in demand automatically lead through to a shift in production unless we're getting the shift in business model that's being talked about here so there's a question there about the role how much of a role can progressive taxation play in tackling this problem how much of a role can influencer culture uh, play in tackling this problem and if we do achieve a shift in demand is that going to logically flow through to a shift in production and we'll go to you first Ruth 
sure I put in the chat just there, but yeah, I completely agree that we need uh, better taxation. We need to tax the rich. And in this case, the rich are not just that richest 20% of consumers, but the executives, founders, and CEOs of fashion brands, of which many are in the Forbes rich list. Um, we This argument of we if we produce less, there'll be less jobs is just such a false dichotomy because the amount of profit in the fashion industry is vast. I don't have the figures on me, but it's in the trillions. This is not a struggling industry. This is an extremely profitable industry. There's more than enough to go around. The problem is the distribution. The problem is the inequality. And if brands and particularly those executives sacrifice their profit to invest back in the supply chain to ensure that those garment workers can keep their jobs while producing less, then we then we would have, we wouldn't have a problem. So yeah, tax the rich. Um, on the on the question of influences, um, yeah, it's really great to see a backlash. We actually um, during that the big hall culture on YouTube. I think it was around 2016. We started a campaign called Hall Alternative, um, where we encouraged those influences to find different ways of enjoying fashion. You know, upcycling, mending, swapping secondhand etc and I, uh, that was really successful and but now we're seeing that second generation on on tiktok um get involved in in halls but um i do think influencers have a huge role to play we do live in an influencer economy um and what's interesting now is that we seem to just have two extremes of very eco-conscious influencers and still um in the pockets of fast fashion influencers um, I think if we follow these influences, if, if we engage with them because they are individual people, um, we can have those conversations, we can ask those questions in the same way that we encourage people to ask brands on social media, you know, who made my clothes, we could say to these influences, you're working with these brands directly, why don't you use your leverage and your power to ask questions. I myself have a social media platform, albeit a small one, and when I get approached by brands, I ask them a standard list of questions about their supply chain if they can't answer them i won't work with them and i think we should encourage influencers to do the same i can't remember what the third question was but um, i'll pass it on to someone else uh, that's that's absolutely fine that was a really comprehensive answer thank you so much ruth and it's interesting to hear your um your takedown if you like of the jobs defense against changing things which of course is something which has been used whenever there is um a challenge to change an inequitable situation i think the jobs defense has been used um uh, as a to try and resist the abolition of slavery to try and resist the introduction of shipping safety you name it it's it's usually the first line of defense of people who who just don't want to change it's very interesting here you talk about how distributional changes can can deal with that so let's go to lewis lewis all right uh thank you much um i'm, I'm going to take the one on the assumptions around consumption-based accounting um I, i'm actually really happy about this question because it, probably i need to differentiate between methodology and the target we use consumption-based accounting as opposed to territorial-based accounting. This, the difference here is in terms of territorial-based accounting, you look at just the emissions happening in a country and the territory within the boundaries of a country. But what happens in the country is dependent a lot on what is happening in China, what is happening in Bangladesh, what is happening in Brazil. You import lots of goods, you export lots of goods. That is not counted within your territory. The reason why we use consumption-based accounting is because Ultimately, you analyze the impact of, the, uh, of, of consumption of fashion from how much someone actually buys. So when you import something from China, or if you import your shirt from China, the impact is calculated as yours, not the person who worked on it in China. The difference here is quite critical because it does a few things. One, it has this embodied emissions. Two, it also shows how in a society, inequality exists, and you cannot assign enough uh, equal responsibility to everyone. Some people have a, a stronger role than others. Some people have a stronger responsibility than, than others. In this case, it's very manifestly the top 20% income earners, as this uh, report shows. The second thing I wanna draw attention to in this case is the curious case of France. France is known sometimes as a fashion capital and uh, all whatnot. But if, if, you, if you look at France, the per capita emissions of France uh, in the report are lower 
than Germany. I'm not suggesting that Germans don't dress better than French, but the, the per capita emissions are lower and lower than Italy and Argentina. This demonstrates the role of leadership and of constructively trying to push an industry in the right direction. What France has done is it's banned destroying of returned items and unsold garments. So almost instantly, the impact per capita sort of reduces. It's also made uh, very mandatory uh, carbon labels for clothing and textiles. And it's imposed upon the sector sort of extended producer responsibility for recycling and other practices where they engage in making sure that uh, there's reduced abuse. I'm not saying France is perfect, it's very far from it and its impact is still too high, but this is an indication of how interventions can start uh, bringing about potential solutions. Now, if I were a, a, um, a business, I would ask myself a very simple question. In a 2030 context where resources are much more scarce, there's a lot of pressure to reduce emissions. And there's a lot of social tension also being driven by my sector, which business will succeed and which will not. It tells you exactly where you fall and whether you even have a viable business strategy or not. I say this because I see someone shopping. In Could Lucy have accidentally. Sorry, I say this because I see someone shopping around in the chat talking about just doing a lot of LCA for every individual product and let the consumer decide for themselves and understand their impact. This is in total ignorance of the importance of context, the power of the industry, and even the challenge of doing an LCA for billions or trillions of items. So let's not try to undermine the magnitude of the problem here and really recognize that even if we are in support of the need for an industry, a viable industry, we cannot pretend that solutions will be easy or that we can just dictate them the way we did in the 1990s and have continued to fail. So, thanks. Thanks, Lewis. Lars. Yes, on the issue of taxation, basically 60 to 7% of textiles are made of plastics, which is made of oil and gas, which is really cheap. So, so as long as, as, as the raw materials are as cheap as they are, it makes a lot of sense for the business to buy these raw materials and produce cheap clothes. So I think it's very much up to the, to the countries to consider this and, and what to do about it. And, and as long as the externalities, as we call it as economists, are not integrated into the prices, it's going to be really, really difficult. So, so I think that that, is, that has to be part of the solution. The, as you mentioned, Louis, the, the, with France and the, the banning of, 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 of unsold and return textiles is really important. But if we don't address the prices in the beginning, it's, it's going to be really hard. Then on the, on the influencer culture, well, I was not born into the influencer culture. When we prepared COP1, the internet did not exist. Huh? So be aware of that. But I do think that as with everything in the textiles and fashion sector, it's a bit of a competition between the mainstream, which is 90 something percent, and the very progressive, circular, sustainable business models. And we need more of the progressive. And I think the same goes to the influencers. You know. We need to have more than 50% of the influencers pulling us in the, in, in the right direction. So then I think we will help. But still, it's, I don't think the demand side can change this. It has to come from the supply side and the politicians. Thanks, Lars. Kiersey. Yes, this is interesting, interesting topic. So we actually have been, have been uh, having this taxation discussion ongoing in Finland, and we have been thinking that should we have some kind of like a carbon, carbon taxations, for example, for the products that are imported to Europe, Europe and, and which have a uh, high carbon footprint, and of course that's uh, direct linked to these climate change issues. It's not very easy if you think about the whole, as well as the life cycle analysis. Uh, calculating carbon footprint is is actually quite a complicated one. So, but this kind of discussion has been ongoing. That might be better that we have some kind of taxation, better taxation, and of course that links to the discussion about sustainability because we have a, also. Um, also examples companies who are doing well they are they are doing things which are correct in the sustainability context and they are they are using more local um, more sustainable fibers for example but that always always 
links to this that well they are higher prices higher prices and then how then the consumer behave if uh, if they are talking about their interest about environmental issues they are they are saying that they would like to be con conscious consumers and making better choices, but at the end, very often in the fashion shop, actually it's the price who is the, which actually the, the, has the biggest uh, influence to the buying, buying uh, decision making. So in that sense, if you really want to support, for example, businesses who are who are doing right actions towards sustainability, actually the taxations might really be like is the, the competition. So it's not only the price that we are talking about. So in that sense, I, I think that some kind of taxation actually would be needed. But of course, then, then, then that needs a wider, uh, wider collaboration between different countries so that everyone has the same kind of system behind of the, behind of the taxation. So it's not very easy, easy to implement. But I think that that kind of things we should have included in the discussion. And then the media influences. Yes, I think that's that would be really important that we have uh, more people on board, because especially the the younger group of consumers, they are uh, influences. Media in, influences are in a way they educators. So in that sense, they have a big power. Also, they they are they have a lot of followers. So in that sense, they can really educate, especially the younger consumer groups, how to be, behave differently and what's the what strengths in the fashion. And I, I see that some of those examples already exist, and I think that that's very good ones. That actually um, we have some some like uh, big figures that that uh, especially younger consumer groups are following. So that's of course is really really important and, and nice examples and, and shifting the demand. Yes, I actually totally agree with Lars that actually this uh, the change have to happen from the business side, from the industry side. And of course, the, then the le legislation and policy are really important ac actors in here. Thanks, Kissy. It's always said of um, taxation that a good approach is to tax more what you want less of and less what you want more of. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Um, I'm going to throw in a question um, to all our speakers. Um, we've lived through a pandemic during which at the height there were some quite um, severe restrictions on our ability to shop. A lot of shops were shut down entirely. Um, only shops selling essentials. In, and even in those, uh, depending upon uh, the type of goods, some of them were limited in terms of the number of things that you could buy. This is still the case um, at the moment in the United Kingdom. We're seeing the big supermarkets rationing eggs. We have a shortage of eggs. Um, one of the things which is kind of implicit in the report, it names the number of garments that would um, be equivalent to having a su sufficiency wardrobe or number of new garments you, you would buy. I wonder how our panelists feel about the idea that, um, as well as these other economic tools like, like that taxation, if we ultimately have to live within a safe spa environmental space, ecological space, a fair consumption space, is there a role for quotas or to give it another word, rationing at all? Um, Ruth. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, the word rationing, because obviously we saw during the last century rationing um, reduce production dramatically in an emergency circumstance. And I think it could be argued that the climate crisis is an equivalent emergency circumstance. Um, who knows? I personally don't see it happening, <laughs> but I do think there should at least be um, conversation about quotas and if sufficient data is presented like it is in this report and like I hope there will be more on the number of you know production units that are within planetary boundaries I think that data should be presented to policymakers to think of, of bold steps and bold approaches because we are in a climate emergency um, but yeah, we can start that as consumers. We can start that in our own wardrobes as well. Um, and I think it's it's quite an empowering um, message that we as consumers don't need to wait for permission or uh, policy to um, to reduce our consumption. We can do that today. So we can all stick a little badge on. I'm rationing myself. Ask me why. Um, I love putting Lewis on the spot. Lewis, what do you think? Quotas. Um, thank you. I, I think some degree of... Um, quotas or, or rationing is inevitable. It's a question of how we do it. And I, I know that people who live in democratic societies, when they hear rationing, they go, whoa, this is crazy. But this is what governments do, they ration. So one way of looking at this is we can ration resource use, which is what uh, uh, businesses use to produce clothing. So almost automatically that influences the volume of production, 
we can ration pollution or we can put sort of limits on pollution that also influences uh, sort of how much you can pollute or you can uh, ration at a level of um, sort of volume in the market or uh, frequency in, in the fashion cycle. There's various ways of approaching this, but you can also look at it from the retail side or from the consumption side in terms of uh, taxes, practices around returns, uh, which is just a given now that you buy one day and you bring back the next day. So the uh, rationing it really has a broad spectrum of possibilities. And I think almost inevitably, it's going to be a part of this, uh, the equation here in solving this problem. Thank you, um, Lewis. Lars. I agree with Lewis that, you know, when you talk about rationing, maybe you should see it a bit differently than what you normally see, that it could be about, you know, uh, rationing resource use on number of, of fashion cycles. Maybe that's easier than, than rationing on the demand side. In terms of the sufficiency wardrobe, I found that really interesting when I read the report both first time when reviewing it and now again, because that might be a tool for us consumers, a little bit, little bit of a guide. So I think there could be a movement in that. It could be interesting. To tr for people to try and see, you know, how much, how many items do they actually need? I hadn't thought about it before I read this, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Maybe they can, you know, I, I can, can, I can move, I can try that at some point. Great, Kissy. Yes, thanks. Uh, yeah, rationing has some negative connotation, but I was thinking that how about changing that for appreciation, because I think that we have so so little appreciation for all the product world that we have around us, as well as the, all the materials that we we are we are having having in our comments. So I think that this can kind of um, understand it, that actually all these are included, a lot of resources, a lot of um, environmental issues uh, included of all products and materials that we are owning. And I was trying to say that, well, actually the, the most sustainable comment is the one that you already have in your wardrobe. So in, in, in a way that we perhaps we have to change our mindset and really begin to think that there are some, some limits of our consumption. And in that sense, I think that all these kind of tools, as was the, mentioned, the, uh, the the size of your wardrobe could be something that people begin to think a little bit more consciously that what actually they are doing. Thank you, Kissy. And and as we know, um, the fashion industry is extremely good at branding. So maybe we need to rebrand rationing as um, entitlement. So instead of saying you're rationed to five garments, you're entitled to five garments. It's got a different bit of a buzz to it, hasn't it? So we've got to the end of our time. I want to say thank you so much also to Diogo, who's been sitting behind the scenes, making sure everything works really, really smoothly. To Dillis, who had to leave us a little bit earlier. Um, to, to Lewis as the director of, of Hot or Cool. To Lars, to Ruth and to Kiersey. Please stay in touch. Um, if you work for an organisation that would like to be part of an ongoing conversation about rapid transition please pop on to rapidtransition.org and consider becoming a member it's free and you get a nice flow of information and updates about things which are happening in the world or around this i have to say my my own fashion declaration is that i get 95 percent of my clothes from one particular charity shop in my south london um, neighborhood um which which, which uh, seems to be there seems to be somebody who's got more money than me who buys clothes which are just my size so i'm kind of very lucky in that regard um i thank you all for being part of this conversation um if you haven't had a chance to read the report yet we've only just published it please dive in and give it a give it a read stay in the conversation and um thank you very much for being here thank you to all our speakers and we'll see you again thanks very much.